Tonight, I am excited to introduce John Freeman, who will be discussing his book, Dictionary of the Undoing. In response to the 2016 election, Freeman began questioning the relationship between words and actions. As he writes in Dictionary of the Undoing, we need to take the one tool being vandalized before our very eyes, language, and reclaim it, and redefine what it means to be an ethical citizen in the present moment. The resulting book is a hybrid of lexicon, essay, guide, and call to action. Dictionary of the Undoing is a necessary text for people in contemporary America who hunger for change. John Freeman is a poet, essayist, and the editor of Freeman's, a literary annual of new writing. His books include How to Read a Novelist and The Tyranny of Email, as well as being the editor of Tales of Two Americas, an anthology of new writing about inequality in the United States today. His debut collection of poems entitled Maps was published in 2017. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, and The New York Times. We are so happy to have John Freeman with us tonight to discuss Dictionary of the Undoing. Please join me in welcoming him to Politics and Prose. How are you? That's good? Oh, thank you for coming out on a cold night. Um, in the middle of uh, impeachment. <laughs> God, what, what happened today? Um, that's partly why I'm here, I guess. Uh, it's just f trying to figure out what was happening in our time. I feel like probably some of you may have shared a certain sense, even without making political assumptions about what you believe, of uh, confusion and frustration and, uh, and, a, and a little bit of anguish that... Uh, that we're using language with such flagrant disregard for its actual meaning. Um, I About two years ago, I, I was watching the news three or four hours a day, trying to collate what had happened during that day, and even an hour or two of the shows which do that collating for you and give you some digest of what's happened wasn't enough because I was tracking what was happening in environmental protection services. I was looking at what was happening in education, what was happening along the border, what was happening in certain other parts of the world. Uh, and it just felt like one giant emergency. And I certainly didn't have it in my uh, bandwidth to sit down and write a kind of endless uh, timeline for everything that was happening. Um, but simultaneously, one thing making it even more difficult was just how language was being... Um, molested and uh, vandalized in plain sight, that words didn't mean what words typically meant. Uh, because even if a word was used correctly, the incorrect use could be used from a higher volume and cancel out the correct use of that word. Um, there was a, for example, there was an article recently about the word investigate. That to investigate something means to ask questions and form a kind of inquiry looking for answers about what has happened in a certain set of scenarios using uh, investigatory practices without a predetermined outcome. Um, so you might investigate what happened after a plane crash, for example, to find out why the plane has crashed. Um, but now investigate means to decide in advance what the outcome of that investigation means and then to smear someone with the word investigation. I'm just re repeating what's actually happening in plain sight. Um, so I decided that simply trying to record information um, was not enough, um, and that if, I, if language was corroded um, too much in front of us, there would be no us. Because without language, I can't speak to you and say even the most basic things if we don't agree upon the meanings of words like citizen or decency uh, or fairness um, or optimism. Um, or teachers. If I say the word teachers to some people, that might mean um, slightly overpaid, uh, poorly, uh, effect, not very effective public servants who really should go and get a better job. Um, I, I'm simply repeating what the messages people are giving out about public school teachers. Um, but to other people, some people, other people, they, the word teacher might call to mind someone who has our children for more hours in the day than we do, um, who needs as much funding as possible, um, who's doing their best to try to give them um, the basic 
necessaries to be a functioning citizen in our world. And so I, I, I decided to step back and think about words that were necessary to be living in a collective. Um, because one thing that has come under assault in the last 10, 20 years is the idea of the collective, of, of an us, um, of anything that involves people sharing um, resources for a public good. Uh, and we, we can't exist if everyone is the most important person. We can't exist if everyone is the most entitled. We can't exist if everyone's the most intelligent or the funniest, the most needed to be listened to. Uh, our society doesn't work that way. We have to share our, our resources. So I started writing down words that um, seemed important, like agitate, and not to be agitated by the news or a kind of flickering image, but to agitate towards something, to agitate towards change. I felt like no one was using the word agitate in that way. I looked at the, the news and I looked at, uh, at the newspaper and I looked at images and I saw bodies constantly being shown as spectacles for pain. Some bodies more than others, some types of bodies more than others. And I thought, why, why is it that we decide that the body now is, is mostly a, 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 a spectacle, something to project onto? So I, I started thinking about the body and I found myself writing what is a very ancient form, uh, an absidarian. Um, and they go back as, as far as the Hebrew Bible. Um, and an absidarian is a poem that begins with every stanza having um, a letter, A, B, C, D, at the start of it. Um, and one of the most famous ones is the Psalm 18, 118. And don't worry, I'm not going to convert any of you. I hope you're all godless if you want to be. And if you don't want to be, that's fine too. I support you in your spirituality. But this is, this is Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is, a, is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So by that point, do to me, you've used A, B, C, and D. And the, the, the words are scrambled, the letters are scrambled so they appear within side of the psalm, within side of the palm. Some other absidarians use the letter at the very beginning of the stanza, and so they're easier to follow. There was one published this, one, this year by an um, Egyptian poet um, named Marwa El Sharaf. Um, book published by Nightboat, and hers was A, A was B, C, beginning each stanza. But I'm just using um, a word as a kind of thing to riff on. So I'll read maybe from a word, and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, and since fairness is something I think we can agree upon, that fairness is a value that maybe we should, like without fairness, why... Why is there an us? Um, uh, this is what happens when I, when I think about fairness. Fair. The word fair is like a mirror we think is a window. Instead of looking through it at the world and all its phenomena, we peer back at ourselves. What do we see? It depends on where we look. Is it fair that at this moment a polar bear is drowning in a rising sea? Is it fair that a fish is on its way to become that bear's meal? Is it fair that some people live longer than others? Is it fair that the rich are taxed at higher rates? Is it fair that they can afford accountants so they never pay those rates? Is it fair that I'm typing this from a warm home while someone else is in a prison cell? Is it fair that my skin color allows me second and third chances while others hardly have one? Would it be fair to make a world that writes some of these balances? How much should be taken from me to do it? Every time we polish fairness to lucidity, it reasserts its relational optic. 
Fairness is the glass that never allows you to look at another without seeing yourself. In this way, it is, it is an essential value in any society, which by definition functions by giving people a sense of order so they can live together, so they can see one another. A society edging towards tyranny has an enormous gap between what people consider to be fair and how the society operates. It, often, it also often sees only in one direction, toward the ruling class, the powerful, or just one man. Any suffering outside this group isn't seen. Everyone knows this is unfair, and that this kind of unfairness, rampant and unchecked, creates apathy in the citizen. In this way, dictators and titans sometimes control the people below them through their agitating demonstrations of unfairness. The brazenness of this narcissism is a kind of numbing narcotic. Think of how much time our society spends gazing at the rich and the powerful, our fabled leaders. In this way, they become gods, not in that they are eternal, but that they are living outside the rules of mere mortals and of fairness. It is possible to claw back from the pre precipices of tyranny if fairness does more than exist as a concept to be publicly flaunted. For a society to function fairly, it cannot always be up to those on the losing side of change to affect change. For, for a society to function fairly, in fact, it is better if change comes from a joint effort between the so-called beneficiaries and the losers of political change, both sides looking through the window and seeing themselves in the glance of their society. Otherwise, history becomes nothing but a power struggle, the powerful taken, taking from the weak until the ruling class loses enough power to be taken from themselves. There is an immense fork in the road for most humans when they learn the idea that there is another in the world. Some of them are taught that fairness is the norm and anything other than that should not be tolerated. Others are taught that fairness ought to be the norm, yet it is not, so that they must learn to cope. The gap between these versions of reality is as wide as the gap between the words just and equitable, the two concepts upon which fairness stands. Justice depends on how a society prosecutes injustice with the laws it writes. Yet all children learn quickly some of these laws are unfair. In the meantime, equity is a far easier notion to square. It is not so necessary to adjudicate. All you have to do is ask, is what you have the same size and scale of what I have. Even though such measurements can be warped by subjective perception, they can be measured. Have you lived a day recently without coming across some measure, some form of inequality? We know that inequality feels miserable, that riches enjoyed in the presence of suffering are spoils, and that suffering when great wealth is being piled up all around us feels ever more like misery. If we were ever to change such things, though, we need help remaking the word fair. We cannot do it alone. Glass is made by heating sand to a temperature none of us can achieve in our ovens at home and then letting it cool. When nuclear scientists tested the first atomic bomb in the deserts of New Mexico, the explosion was so powerful it turned the sand around it to glass. So it sometimes must be with societies and fairness. They settle and settle like silt into patterns of unfairness, and then a superheated rupture must occur for them to create fairness all over again. Sometimes that heat is made by protest. Sometimes it is made by trauma. In the best of times, it is made by debate, by the friction of concepts rubbing up against each other in open space, creating an intense fire by a positive agitation, at the end of which things cool and there's a new kind of fairness, even then, it will not be entirely transparent glass. Like glass is to mirror, it will be more like a frozen, like glass is to a mirror, it will be more like a frozen liquid resting up against something silver and noble. A frozen snapshot of what our society made into law resting up against the, the eternal inner sense of equity, the one we recognize in the way we know when the moon is out before looking up. So I think one of the um, destabilizing things about our current time is that there has been and always will be a gap between 
um, laws and norms. Um, and hopefully the gap is small. Um, and then our society uh, is adjudicated in the way that we feel like it ought to be, in the way that we talk about it as being. Um, but we're in a period right now of a lot of our norms being changed and shifted before our very eyes. Uh, in some ways, Me Too was a movement about changing some of those norms. Um, and yet there's a gap between the laws, the norms, and actual pe people behavior. So spoken norms say you cannot be flagrantly, terribly uh, sexist. Um, and yet, if you walk down the street as a woman, you might experience the fact that those norms are not always practiced. Um, and that's not, not necessarily against the law either, um, to have someone say something rude to you. Uh, and these norms are being sm uh, changed and smashed in positive ways, um, but also in very negative ways. Uh, and so when norms are, are, are moved, um, we realize how much of our society depends upon uh, a network of, of agreed upon ideas and concepts. And uh, what, when those things are removed, um, we're without something that allows us to function together as, a, as an us. Um, so this is what I thought about when I thought about norms. Societies need norms almost as much as they need laws even those run by parliamentary governments in which norms become the laws. Norms are manners writ large. A law says you must. A norm says you ought. This is the way we do it. Each time someone changes a norm, she reminds us of a gap between legislation and behavior. She also affirms, affirms the ability of a society to police that gap among itself. A society that legislated every aspect of civil life would trust nothing to human decency. And yet the history of any society teaches that legislation does not always bend toward the arc of justice. Also, some norms are cruel. For instance, prior to Jim Crow laws, it was simply the norm to treat people of color as subhuman. With their passage, it became the law. And so legislation needs to intervene when norms are monstrous, and it has to intervene with itself when those laws are monstrous. It has been the norm to beat women. It has been the norm to work children to death. It has been the norm to enslave people. It has been the norm to look the other way when members of a church abuse its, its, uh, its young children. It has been the norm to treat female desire as dangerous. It has been the norm to allow only opposite sex couples to display affection in public. It has been the norm to treat female employees as sexual objects. It has been the norm for many cultures to project their fears upon black bodies. It has been the norm to discourage women from pursuing intellectual education. It has been the norm to carry guns. It has been the norm for men to do all the talking. It, this is my event, so. Um, but you're welcome to talk in like four seconds. <laughs> It has been the norm never to enter a doorway before a woman or a child younger than eight years old. It has been the norm not to speak about money. Norms tell us as much about a society as its culture does, the latter often dealing with fantasies and nightmares. By contrast, norms track the status quo and by and large reinforce it. Over time, especially in informal societies and those with yawning inequalities like ours, the status quo becomes a kind of pejorative, as it should. But some parts of the status quo are necessary. Tactical norms or manners formalize decency. They tell us how to act in social situations and in so doing lubricate interactions and create a shorthand for kindness. Furthermore, reality is by nature chaotic. Some agreement on what is real, tangible, and true is absolutely necessary for any society to function. In this way, small-scale norms and manners make a society, they make reality, they render it possible to function. Many tyrants have, have rightly discovered that the swiftest way to undercut a civil society is to flaunt its norms. Coups are dangerous and costly. Revolutions take time. Turning a society upon itself by destroying its norms can be done rapidly in our digital era. Why? Every time a citizen enacts a norm, a small, perhaps mostly inaudible, internal voice is suppressed. One that is saying, I, 
I, I, one that brags, one that stomps and chants for its own liberty. Sadly, many of the most powerful citizens in societies have to unlearn bigotry. They have to be educated into seeing their privileges, the point where their entitlement meets the disenfranchisement of another person. So a psychic undercurrent of resentment will always run beneath a society which is attempting to do this delicate disarming of its powerful few. Many societies that see themselves as having a color problem or an immigration problem or an issue with any single group, in fact, have a bigger problem with power, as in those who refuse to give it up, share it, or simply put aside their ability to hurt people and to not call that sadism. A highly visible person who exalts in the flaunting of norms can be an explosive figure in this environment. With a powerful few strikes against norms, he can tap into that undercurrent of resentment and agitate it forth. The force with which such resentment geysers up in cultures ruled by norms will be mistaken for a revolution and may even feel like social change. But the spouting river of resentment is neither. It's simply the released pressure of vandalized norms. In societies that have had a status quo, there's a deranged pleasure in this moment, just as there's a more innocent happiness in being caught in a sudden and torrential downpour. But a tyrant destroying norms isn't the weather. He's often making the weather. Societies that have had a status quo are especially prone to confusing the two, as the chattering classes seek to diagnose this sudden shift in climate. The aspirational tyrant, tyrant, meanwhile, gleefully swings another axe, cutting down another norm. We've been living through such an extraordinary period in recent years. A great many underground streams, creeks, and yes, rivers have been unleashed with a few key performances of mendacity. And now as we stand about in a landscape reigning with the unleashed resentments of the powerful, our governments are exploiting the chaos to consolidate even more control. It is a bizarre and stressful period for everyone, but especially those who saw it coming. The arcs of norms always pivot too easily on the treatment of the weak or anyone who isn't considered quote-unquote normal, of the people a society designates as less than so that it can define its citizens by subtraction. The demolishment of norms does not often lead to kinder ones. It can lead all too quickly to a return to lethal ones. The civil rights era of the 1960s, for instance, gave way to the mass incarceration of the 1970s. One of the bewildering moods of our present moment revolves around the way that culture, chaos, and tyranny can seem immune to ridicule. Comedians, the best of them after all, function in this space, exploding norms that have become so sacred they are unsayable. Satire always turns its flames towards the coal of a society's absurdities, many of which are contained in its norms. There's often a lot of heat trapped in there, Cultural figures who produce such art are necessary, and sometimes they live outside the the rules of society so that they can jest about it. Societies need these figures, these artists, dearly, because they can because they can bring. Sorry, societies need these artists so dearly that they desperately try to bring them into the fold, and in so doing, normalize the critique. But when someone who functions like a comedian or a satirist skewering or demolishing norms in public, manages to secure the centers of power. One would think revolution would be the result. In fact, with the right vectors of political power, a society's response often mimics its treatment of those dangerous comedians. It tries to normalize such a person, to build a coherent new sense of reality by enfolding this agent of chaos into its view of itself. We really are that divided. It really is that awful here. One can especially watch this happening with autocrats. First, their photograph begins appearing everywhere, above the fold, on the newspaper, every day. The news always has their picture on. As if we might forget they exist, were we not reminded of them? Then the commentariat builds a kind of intellectual scaffolding. And then 
the old guard of normative culture embraces this person, even if it's briefly. And by this point, this person could have amassed the power of an actual autocrat. And by then, it may be too late to joke him off stage. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> no, no. Oh, I, um, so yeah, um, I was trying to write this uh, these essays um, without using the first person um, because I, I, as I was saying, I, I feel like by attacking language right now, and I don't think it's because this administration or previous administrations were linguists. They're attacking the ability to exist as collectives. Um, and if you can't define a we, and of course, there are reasons within liberal culture why a presumed uh, dominant white Anglo-Saxon male we um, would have other groups who are also we's withdrawing from that we and its presumptions, if that makes any sense. Um, so if I, uh, for example, if I were to stand in, in a pulpit and talk about we, but not address some of the concerns of other people in a group, um, some people might withdraw from that we. And I think part of what's happened in the last 20 to 30 years of American life has been, has been about that, um, has been about the presumptions of a collective which does, do not pay attention to all of its constituents. But simultaneously, I think the last 20 years um, of political life and of news life, we've watched politicians go after um, collectives because collectives are powerful. Um, and it's not just teachers, it's not unions, um, but it's groups of people that talk to each other. Um, and I think one of the things that knits, knits us together is not the internet necessarily, it's human networks. And human networks are made by, by language and by its stable meaning. Um, and so these performances, and I have to call them this, but the performances you see on the news when someone's responding to a journalist's question and they contradict themselves within 30 seconds, um, right in front of your eyes uh, is, is one way in which we're beginning to um, undo the power of language. Uh, because if nothing means anything, then something can mean whatever the person it is saying it wants it to mean, uh, does that, if that makes any sense. And so this chaos of, of um, relativity and meaninglessness um, is a created situation. Um, and I, part of this book is to try to encourage us to step back from the, the channels of entertainment and media and just movement of, of information and words to get into slower ones, to get into groups, to, to, to be places where we can look each other in the eye, um, to read more slowly, um, to live more, uh, live more mindfully. Um, and I think in, in, if we reclaim some of those things, and I'm not just a huge fan of independent bookstores, but I am, um, but public spaces. Uh, I think we can reclaim some of the power of what it means to be interacting with complexity and dignity. Um, and, and because I think if I were to stand here and offend all of your decency, uh, you would probably all leave, or at least you would start talking back to me. Uh, but when it's someone on stage uh, in front of cameras who's broadcasting to the rest you know, of the country, people watching in their bedrooms and who have Twitter feeds, um, hateful rhetoric that they can then repeat and, and spread without even looking at the face of anyone or encountering anyone upon whom that rhetoric is projected or directed at. It's a, it's a precursor, I think, and it, it's not even a precursor. It's, a, it's an argument for violence, for violence against the body. And we've seen there was a school shooting today uh, and I, I, we can't live this way. Um, it's, in, it's intolerable and it's unsustainable. Uh, and it's frankly frightening. And it's more frightening for other people than for some. And I, part of the reason I wrote this book is I've, I've been protected my whole life by being in this body, in this skin color, for having the family I did, you know. And it's, it's things will not change if, if it's, only people who are in the most threatened situation standing up for themselves. And this is what's demoralizing and anguishing about this present moment is 
50 percent, now we'll get political, 50 percent of this country supports impeachment and removal of this president. Uh, and there's a Senate which was elected, there's a majority of Republicans who are not a, a elected by a majority of the country standing between his removal um, and, and him being acquitted. And we're, we're looking at something that is looking very much like the, being ruled by a tyranny of a minor, minority. And you look at the men, and they're all men, almost. Almost all, except for Lisa Murkowski, who's nowhere to be seen. Or Susan Collins, you know, who's also nowhere to be seen. You, you look when Trump is standing in front of a microphone, and, and it's 25 white men behind him. And if it's not what he's saying, he's demonstrating symbolically something that looks a lot like um, white supremacy. And I have to use those terms because the policies and the words coming out of his mouth match that. Um, and we can't live this way. You know, we, we on, honestly, we can't live this way as a country. So, uh, so I tried to write something that would give us an opportunity to step away from the, that spectacle and maybe, hopefully, give a reader or two somewhere, some energy to, to, to leave the couch and leave the, <laughs> leave the comfort of, of the screens and go places publicly. Because I think in general, our decency lives in those public spaces. It's a lot easier and more natural uh, to be kind to people like and unlike us in person than it is to do it over the internet. And we've been sold a uh, we've been sold a life of of abstractions, you know. This is in some ways what it means to live in a capital system. And there have been so many benefits to that, but some some of the weaknesses are the way that it abstracts the value of so many important things um, in order for it to move, like capital. So labor has been abstracted to something that's almost re it completely removed from sweat in the body. And I think we need to return to, to fewer and fewer abstractions. And to me, words are not abstractions. They're something that you make with your, if you can speak, you, you make it with your muscle and your, and your mouth, you know? And when it's said from one person to another, right, you say it and you watch the other person's reaction. And that kind of slow moving language, I think is, is a kinder language because I, you know, stand here speaking right now, I can see your faces. I can see your reactions to what I'm saying. I can see you thinking, you know, I can see you having other thoughts that are maybe not even in this room. Maybe you're dealing with other experiences that some of these words have called to mind, other feelings, other sort of private, you know, anguishes or moments. Anyone ever read that Robert Hayden poem about his father feeding the coal furnace? And, he, and he's sitting in bed and he's talking about how his, every morning his father would go down and put coal into the furnace and warm the house. And he was thinking about how he got to lay there silently while his father was doing this. And he, and he remembers how, how, if not derisive, then cavalier he was about this. Um, and then he imagines himself into his father's body. And it ends with that great line, like, what did I know of love's lonely offices? And I think even though we're living in an agitating time, we're living in a very lonely time, you know, isolating TV and technology, technology in general because of its prosthetic qualities is an isolating thing. The car allows us to live further from our places of work. The telephone allows us to live less as families. The internet allows us to live further and further from centers that we think of and consider to be our, our home. It allows us to choose and get our information from not a newspaper anymore, although the post is here, it's great. You know, you can, I can read the Sacramento Bee in New York City instead of dealing with what's happening right in front of me. And more and more, we're being sold all these conveniences that make us more and more isolated. And so the, this economy of convenience 
is being used against us. And then through it, we're being fed a derangement of language. Uh, and I could talk about words that are being used, that are being used badly or just um, that pop up. We know what weaponize was a word. Remember that? Like six months ago, it was like, we're going to weaponize this piece of information against them uh, or litigate. We're not going to relitigate the election of 2016. And I thought, God, we're living. It, the, the words were almost like sort of symptoms of our time. So these words um, agitate body, citizen, decency, environment, fairness, giving, hope, I, justice, killing, love, monuments, norms, optimism, police, questions, rage, spirit, teachers, usurp, vote, women, X is for anonymous, you and zygote, to me are essential. Uh, they're my essential words. Um, they're not all positive words. There's nothing positive about killing, even if it's to make a stake. Um, the cow would disagree with you. Uh, but I think by thinking about language more, um, we can create a richer world in us in which we can live together. And my hope is, you know, this is, this is just an idea of a form, that I, it's an old form. And it would be neat to me, I signed this, I have gra uh, graduate students, but I taught a bunch of undergrads, and I gave, gave, gave them the assignment of them making their own dictionary. It was fantastic. Some of them told stories, you know. Some of them wrote poems. One of them, a trans student, was a, was a, a trans dictionary of dignity, of how to respect their dignity. Um, and I think if, if our dictionary shelves were a little bit more open-minded, you know, so that you did have Webster's and the OED, and then some other dictionaries, uh, I would think that would be quite cool. Because in some ways, a story is, is a lexicon. You know, it's a, it tells you everything you need to know. It's the definition of, of a family or of a person. Story can sometimes be a, a, a definition of a place. Um, my hope is this is a, a lexicon of engagement of, and, of, and of decency, of being decent to each other. So that's my story. Um, does anybody have any questions? No, I do. <clears throat> First of all, thank you so much for this invaluable work. I come to a lot of readings here. Nothing I've heard here is more important than what you're saying here. And I wish this pace was packed to hear what you have to say. You know, just like history is written by the victors, it seems like now that reality is being written by the those in power. Yeah. And what troubles me most is not people having authentic misunderstand um, differences about um, the meanings of words, but leaders intentionally misusing words. Yeah. So I w wonder if you could comment on that maybe. To, uh, yeah, maybe no, I, 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 that's where it, um, this happened, um, this has happened, I think, throughout time, but um, one thing that came immediately to mind was the Clean Air Act, um, which was a really Orwellian use of those words because the Clean Air Act allowed companies to pollute ever more than before. Um, and I think we've entered an Orwellian period where uh, through the kind of universe, the universal uh, comfort with and understanding that we're gonna be marketed to has created a cynicism and irony that has meant that um, to the uninformed politicians and political leaders can deliberately and, and, and perniciously use language against its actual meaning. Right to work, for instance. For, yeah, and the right to work. That's, you know, the, um, that, th this, this, is, this has been coming for 20 years, and it's slightly frightening. Um, your other point, though, about um, language being used, mi misused deliberately, I think uh, is is really being expressed right now um, in that uh, I think basically because we've entered a news cycle that's so fast that the, the corrections cannot keep up with the inaccuracies. And as you know, when you read, read the newspaper before there was a 24-hour news cycle, you would read a correction, but you'd have to remember the article that you read the correction to. And so if the news cycle is being fed by 
um, sound bites and interview clips um, that are coming out at a rate that's impossible for us to collate and make coherent, the in- inaccuracies within it, um, the current president has, you know, has told thousands of mistruths or lies since being elected. Um, it, it just simply means that there, the, the speed is so great that there's no penalty for lying and that there's no need to actually even try to tell the truth. And under, in the Bush administration, Karl Rove had that famous quote of saying, we're, we're, you know, we're not in the, what did he say? We're in the reality creation business. If you don't mind, I wrote the quote up right here. Oh, I was thank going you. to share it. It was, we're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to study what we do. Yes. It's funny. So my question was, it's the kind of thing where if you heard this today, you'd expect it was playing on the news or like that Stephen Miller wrote it in an email. (laughs) But actually, no, it was Karl Rove saying this supposedly in the White House in 2004. Yeah. I suppose my question is, why do you think it is that despite the fact that what's happening right now is a link in this chain of violence going back many years to the Bush administration, to the Reagan administration, to the reconstruction, and even before that mm. in the history of this country. Why is, why do you think it is that so many people, at least people I've met, don't draw those sort of links back and instead kind of see what's happening now as this single kind of singular oddity mm. versus an evolution of what's always been there? or kind of the last domino in a long line of dominoes just being knocked down. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think this is a new phenomenon. I think it's been coming since the beginning of the Republic, mm-hmm. something that the Republic is in its founding documents was dealing with. Um, there's a contradiction in the very founding document where some people were three-fifths of a human being. And that it's the negative capability that that requires as a citizen um, is, so, is greater than our capacity now to inhabit it. Um, and also we have not educated our citizenry in order to live within that contradiction and to understand that it, it is a contradiction. So instead, we live within a side, a greater and greater memory hole that's, that's fed by the access to enormous amounts of entertainment and news and, and strategy as news um, rather than context and complexity. Um, and news used to be in the, com- in the complexity business and now it's in the, um, I don't even know what to call it, but I, I, was, I was running on the treadmill before I came here and I was trying to watch the news through the mirror in front of the treadmill and read the news backwards, which um, was almost as demonic as the news itself. Uh, but one, one of the things I, I saw, I, I was trying to read what it said and it said, um, uh, basically, it's, what does it say? Buyer's remorse was the, you know, to the Democrats' re- re- um, it was Fox, but it said buyer's remorse to the Democrats um, uh, regret having gone into impeachment. And already, you know, we're two days into what could be a hu- several hundred day investigation uh, slash, you know, impeachment cycles slash trial in, in the Senate. And it was like leapfrogging over into the end cycle of, of the debate. And that kind of, that kind of rhetoric is being projected out into a, a population that we've that's been deliberately um, uneducated. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, we don't fight wars and have economic development, but then we ruined ourselves with the economic development and the environment. And I don't want to know anybody like, you need to think about this without that kind of brain. The climate change is it causes disastrous impacts as everybody is projecting that has a brain. These kids and these grandkids are going to have to go back to the up from their streams. Right now, they're living on the veneer. They don't know how to get water out of the atmosphere. They don't know how to grow food. They don't know how to, you know, take care of themselves or their families. Everybody's living on the veneer of the cheap IKEA table, right? Mm-hmm. And it's going to crash. So, do you address that 
Right? Yeah. No, I, E is for environment. And I'm trying to, um, I redefine the environment as not something that it's like a cozy concept for which you can care about. It's actually a living thing that we're living, that we're living amidst that is screaming at us for attention and intervention. And we're not listening because we are spending our attention elsewhere. And wise for you is a way to basically say, no one's coming to save us. There's no rescue bus. There's no sort of magic you know, climate change, you know, van that's going to come around and, and, and spray things out of the trees and that we really are in a, in an absolute crisis about what's going to happen. And I have a book coming out in April called Tales of Two Planets, which is about inequality and, and global climate crisis and how it's going to affect different places around the world faster than others. And the United States, although some of the coastlines are, Miami will be underwater possibly in 30 years, um, but it won't be that bad to be in Ohio, you know, or <laughs> Minnesota might get more, more dumps. There might be more tornadoes in, 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 the, in the Midwest. Um, but it's going to be terrible to be in Bangkok or Osaka um, or in Niger. And so the, the collectivity, which has been um, uh, atta attacked and, and bred out of us by this idea of being the, the ultimate consumer and the sort of liberated self on the internet is going to be essential to us, sol uh, not solving, but um, at least surviving the climate crisis as a, as a planet. Because otherwise, it's going to get really dark really fast. So I agree with you about the... And I think I, I've, I have some teenagers I know, um, and the, the people that are 17 to 19 have dropped out entirely of the internet. They're extremely engaged. They're not, they don't care about Facebook and Instagram likes. They're, they're angry. They're politically motivated. Um, they go to protests. Uh, they're, not, um, they're not casual about their use of plastics and all sorts of other things. And they really are demanding politicians have platforms that have, a, have climate, the climate crisis and, and some policies that are addressing it at the heart of what they're um, campaigning on. Yeah, they need to know how to. Yes. Yeah, I I agree with that too. And that's been well, that's been sort of one of the luxuries of the living in the first world, is to live amidst technology and conveniences that you have no idea how they operate, and yet you simply can just walk out of this building and take out your supercomputer, the size of your your palm, and dial up you know a driver who will appear you know, in a two ton SUV in, in three minutes and you'll be angry if it takes him eight. So I, I think some of those, those, those things, you know, my, my friend here, was, we're, we've been talking and having conversations that we, we will probably live in an era without air travel at some point or where it will be significantly curtailed um, unless there's a dramatic new invention uh, of, a, of a kind of airplane engine um, because we will not be able to live, continue to live and fly the way we do. Um, so, yeah, I think, and the propaganda that is being, I, I agree. I think a lot of what um, winds up into the, the broadcast news is, is, is propaganda. And I don't think the news itself thinks of it as that, but I think it has ended, ended up becoming the delivery system for it. And, and so my push on this in this book is to say, if you're aware of that, if you feel that, then step back from it and find spaces where you can define meaning on terms that are closer to you and where you can feel like you can do things um, that affect at least some part of reality around you. Yes, you have a question. Yeah, I have a confession. <laughs> I'm a, a word person who happens to live just across the street, basically. And when I read a brief description of your book, I had no idea that it, the depth of the information that you were going to give tonight and it, it, the meditative quality of it, 
the, I'm a meditator myself, but it, there was something about it, the way you pursued ideas. It, you're like j riffing on a jazz, <laughs> 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 playing you. with words, and but playing with ideas. And I, I was totally surprised tonight to oh. what I heard so and bad. your presentation. So, I, but the... The description of the book does not in any way <laughs> tell me yeah, what I was going to see tonight. I, yeah, it's sort of, well, you do that in every capacity. Do you describe and then under-deliver, or do you describe and, and maybe surprise? Um, and I think they elected for the surprise in the description on the back of this book. But I think what you said means something to me because I feel we have fewer and fewer spaces for meditative type thinking, for thinking without a predetermined outcome. And to me, the essay as a form is a place in which to encounter an idea and turn it around and look at it from several different angles, Playing with rather than to, you know, come with a predetermined idea for what something means. Because that's just another, you know, I'm not the language Politburo here saying, you know, fairness is X, Y, and Z. It's, it's a sort of, so many of these words mean, um, have to be turned around from very different angles to be to be looked at. And I, as a writer and as a person, I just, I feel very defensive for those types of spaces where you can exist in a state of almost knowing or, or, or confusion that's bending towards cl clarity. Because certainties are, are dangerous. You know, certainties mean you don't listen at all. And uh, about the only thing I'm certain about is that the, the the language conditions that we live in right now are not sustainable, you know, for for meaningful life, let alone for happiness. I think all of us feel kind of ground ground down, you know, like a sense of weariness. I feel pick I feel beaten on every day. Like this sort of jackhammer in the background is is taking words and chiseling them down into various parts. And they're not even selling off the various slag, you know. It's just, you're just watching and certain words get really destroyed. And I think your riffs are also giving people a recognition that we don't have time, don't take the time to stop and do sit under a tree and play with ideas. That that is no longer a part of our culture. Where I, I worry where, where, where we'd be without ideas, though. You know, an idea can be... An idea can be a beautiful thing, you know? Right now, I think we see a lot of really ugly ideas, you know? And I, I, I want to think, I want to respond to and reject those ideas with, with more open and beautiful ideas, not with um, attacks on the person, you know? And that's why I don't use Trump's name in this book, because I think his name's everywhere. Everyone knows that. <laughs> It's not him. He's a symptom of something larger. Um, you've been really lovely listening for this long. Um, uh, there's um, some books somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, at the front? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he'll tell you. Yeah, there's uh, books available at the registers, and we are going to have a signing right here at the table. So, And if I could ask everyone to please fold up your chairs, it would be fantastic. So thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for coming. Time.